right, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to look at a book called The Secret Teaching of All Ages by Manley P. Hall, 33rd Degree Freemason. I'm really just going to go through this book, so it might be kind of boring for some people, but this book does explain quite a few things about the androgynous alchemical agenda. All right, so if you're interested in what these uh, people that I talk about here on my channel what they actually believe, where they get their ideas, why they are trying to become androgynous, why do they want to turn their human race into a race of androgynes. There may be some answers here in this video. So the subtitle is an encyclopedic outline of Masonic, Hermetic, Kabbalistic, and Rosicrucian symbolical philosophy being an interpretation of the secret teachings concealed within the rituals, allegories, and mysteries of all ages. I believe, and it's fairly well documented that the uh, leaders of this world believe in these kind of things that we're going to look at, and they're practicing them. All right, so this is written in 1928. Let's begin. All right, here in yellow it says, The science of equilibrium is the key of occult science. Okay, so equilibrium, that's one of the key words, and when they talk about alchemy... They're not talking about turning lead into gold. They're talking about turning a human into something divine. And the, the way they go about doing that is through the practice of androgyny, which is, and they have a lot of keywords such as equilibrium, balance, unity, harmony, things like that. And up there on top, it says the Kabbalists next established a human figure in each of the four worlds. All right, now I don't have time to get into all these four worlds and all that, but it says these four are called the world men. And this relates back to Adam Cadmon, the androgynous Adam we've seen before. They are considered androgynous and are the prototypes of humanity. So if you have a religion where you believe the prototypes of humanity are androgynous, it might make sense that you want to become androgynous again, right? And again, here we've seen this before, the archetypal man, Adam Cadmon. All right, this is Kabbalah. This is what a lot of Jews believe even today. Who, in his individuality or unity, is yet dual or bisexual, which means male hyphen female. He's the prototype of all humanity. The first androgyne at the apex of the upper triangle. A masculine active potency combined with a feminine passive potency. From the union of these two was produced beauty, clemency, the spiritual son, known by the divine name, Elohim. So they have a kind of a funny way of reading the Bible, and they interpret it totally differently. All right, so and again here, they're talking about the tree of life, tree of knowledge of good and evil, the mystery of equilibrium, of course, right? They see equilibrium as uh, like salvation, balance, the secret of immortality, all right? <laughs> tree of the knowledge of good and evil represents polarity or unbalance, the secret of mortality. So Polarity and unbalance, that's bad. That results in death, the separation of the two sexes. So their goal is to get back into balance, and that will result in immortality. Unbalanced forces perish in the void, declares the secret work. And then it says below, humanity will ultimately regain completion. Now they're talking about an Egyptian god named uh, Serapis, who had manly strength and womanly grace. And whose face had a heavy beard, but was also decidedly feminine. The figure of Serapis was usually robed from head to foot in heavy draperies, well, kind of like the Statue of Liberty, believed by initiates to conceal the fact that his body was androgynous. All right, so this androgynous deity goes back to Egypt and even further back, all across antiquity, you'll come across androgynous gods and also this idea of the original androgynous human, all right? To the Egyptians, the Sphinx was the symbol of strength and intelligence. It was portrayed as androgynous, partaking of both the positive and negative creative powers. The secret of the Sphinx, masculine in front, feminine behind. The pharaohs were male in front and female behind. Like the gods, they included the dual totality of being in one person, born of the mother, but of both sexes as the child. All right, so they have uh, Isis and Osiris, mother and father, 
Horus was the androgynous child, the merger of the two, all right? So the child of male and female gods is actually a union of the male and female gods, the true androgyne. Now, Pythagoras is another alchemist. In fact, all these famous scientists from the past, they're all alchemists, all right? Now, this is a major influence on alchemical uh, thought here. And he's saying, uh, talking about the numbers, unity or one, therefore, was considered an androgynous number partaking of both the masculine and the feminine attributes. We've got some jargon here, monad and duad. Monad, one, is so-called because it remains always in the same condition that is separate from multitude. This thing of mono, right, it means one. It is called mind because the mind is stable. Hermaphrodism because it is both male and female. One is an androgyne. And even God, right? They believe God is androgynous, right? The receptacle of matter because it produces the duad, which is essentially material. So the material world is not mono. It's not a monad. It's a duad. It's duality. The material world is in the fallen state because it's separated into different things, light and dark, good and evil, male and female. That's why you see the checkerboard floors on their buildings, because that's the lowest part of the building represents the duality of the material world, that they're trying to rise above that into the monad. Following symbolic names were given to the duad, two because it has been divided, and is two rather than one. And when there are two, each is opposed to the other, causing chaos, death, generation, mutation, division, misfortune. (laughs) It goes on and on, right? It's just a horrible thing. Yes, we are in a fallen world, but not because of the separation of the sexes right? I mean, if you just read the Bible. Now, remember, this is written by a 33rd degree Freemason. Masonry will be in a position to solve many of the secrets of its esoteric doctrine when it realizes that both its single and double-headed eagles are phoenixes. All right, so the double-headed eagle, one of the main symbols of Freemasonry, you see it everywhere. They have it on their lodges and whatnot, And a lot of governments use it. And uh, now the U.S. government uses a single-headed phoenix, but I believe it does represent the double-headed phoenix. Represents the reborn androgynous race, all right, which is what the United States is all about. Sorry to tell you. And that to all initiates and philosophers, all right, initiates and philosophers. Philosophers is another one of these key words. The phoenix is the symbol of the transmutation and regeneration of the creative energy, commonly called the accomplishment of the great work. What is the great work? What are they doing? What are they motivated by? What are they trying to achieve? The double-headed phoenix is the prototype of an androgynous man. That's the great work to create the androgynous man. Their symbol is the double-headed phoenix. It's telling you right there. For according to the secret teachings, there will come a time when the human body will have two spinal cords by means of which vibratory equilibrium will be maintained in the body. Now, I don't know what this two spinal cord thing is is really talking about. It may be metaphorical. Maybe they're working on something. Not only were many of the founders of the United States government masons, but they received aid from a secret and august body existing in Europe, which helped them to establish this country for a peculiar and particular purpose known only to the initiated few. The great seal is the signature of this exalted body, unseen and for the most part unknown, and the unfinished pyramid upon its reverse side is a trestle board setting forth symbolically the task to the accomplishment for which the United States government was dedicated from the day of its inception. The new Atlantis, the great work, the androgynous man, which they are now trying to sign into law via the Equality Act, right? Equality, equilibrium, androgyny, all right? Vibratory equilibrium, all right? So basically they're saying there, there will come a time when the human body will be androgynous. And this is what they're going to do on a mass scale. And I believe, this is why I talk about this subject, by the way, I believe this will result in the end times and the return of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. They're trying to exterminate humanity, sterilizing humanity, transforming us into abomination, while at the same time promising salvation. That's why I talk about this subject, because I think it's somewhat important. All right, here's Morals and Dogma of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry by Albert Pike. Equilibrium. (laughs) 
Yeah, so equilibrium is kind of a big part of Freemasonry. Man attains the purposes of his being when his two natures are in equilibrium. You see that right there? Man attains the purposes of his being when his two natures are in equilibrium. What two natures, you might ask? Well, the male and the female. And speaking of Washington, D.C., there is a statue of Albert Pike right in the middle of Washington, D.C., and there's the double-headed phoenix right there in front of the statue being held up by some kind of goddess. There's all kinds of these heavily robed goddesses and gods all throughout Washington, D.C., statues. And Albert Pike, of course, is a 33rd degree Freemason, one of the guys who kind of revived the alchemical, esoteric, Kabbalistic type of Freemasonry in the United States. All right, they have a statue to a 33rd degree Freemason right there in Washington, D.C., with the double-headed phoenix, the symbol of the androgynous man rising from the ashes of the duad into the monad. Back to mono. 